Uh, and thanks to the uh, legislature, those who homeschool or mm-hmm. attend private schools can play sports at the local public school if their private school does not offer that sport. We want to welcome in the former education chair and now the alternative at, uh, education chair, Senator Patricia Rucker. Did I get the title kind of correct? Kind of. So they decided before the session began to shorten it to School Choice Committee. School Choice Committee. Because didn't it start off as Alternative Alternative Education education Committee? Yes. Chair? I guess they decided it was a little too long. It's a lot on a business card. (laughs) Yeah. I got you. So as uh, that is now law, has the governor signed it? He has not yet, but uh, we expect him to. We Mm -hmm. haven't heard any concerns or issues with it. So uh, it is definitely past the House and the Senate. Okay. And this will permit any student at a private school or who's homeschooled. I think that was already in place, was it not, the homeschool? So the homeschool part was in place with a one virtual class uh, requirement. So the homeschooler would have to do one virtual class with a public school in the state um, in order to qualify to be part of it. We took away that requirement and so now we treat everyone exactly the same no matter whether they're in private school, homeschool, micro school, whether they're a Hope Scholarship or not, Hope Scholarship recipient. Um, It doesn't matter. You would under the exact same conditions and the exact same rules that WVSSAC has for public school students, you have to follow all the same rules, you would be able to try out for an extracurricular sport or activity. Um, And this also includes, as many people know, like marching band, Mm -hmm. those type of activities too. Okay, very good. The uh, the, the legislature also approved an adjustment to the transfer rules, where you can now transfer one time public school to public school? In the four years of high school. Mm -hmm. So it was already allowed a one time transfer in the ninth grade year, you know, Mm -hmm. taking into account that some people, you know, realize that that doesn't work for them. This allows, it essentially takes away the the ninth grade transfer provision and just allows a one-time transfer any time in the high school year. So maybe it's 10th grade that you realize this isn't the school for me, or maybe it's an 11th grade, but the point is just a one-time transfer is allowed without the one-year penalty of having to sit out of sports. Whenever I'm confused on what stance I want to take on a bill like this, I wait to see what the SSAC opinion is, and then I go the opposite way. (laughs) (laughs) So they were completely against this. Well, so um, to be fair, they never spoke to me about any opposition. We've been um, working on this from the Senate side for many years. And in the beginning, when we tried to introduce this, they would oppose it. They would come to committees. They would say, you know, no, this is a bad idea. Um, it, It may allow for athletes or parents to pick the school that they want to play at. They're doing it already. Mm -hmm. Well, so here's the thing. I will tell you, for those who have taken advantage of those type of things are the people who have a lot of money. Because even if they're denied under the current WVSSAC rules that we have right now, if you have enough money to sue them and you take them to court, almost inevitably the court rules with the parents or the student to allow them. So if you're rich, you're able to get around the current rules that we have. But the average everyday West Virginian, of course, does not have that kind of money or those kind of resources, I should say. And the other thing that is, um, to me, was very important, and I've been pushing for this since I got in the legislature. So it's been a consistent seven years um, to finally get it through, and I can tell you I'm very grateful. The the idea that you would punish a student when the parent chooses to um, move them from, let's say, public school to homeschooling because they feel their child is not getting what they need, or a parent sacrifices and pays for private school, which is a huge sacrifice until the Hope Scholarship, you know, we didn't provide any support for parents if they chose to do that and you're gonna punish that student by not letting them play their baseball or cross country or track or be part of the marching band. And that private school doesn't offer it. And homeschoolers don't have access to those type of things. The idea that it's okay to punish a student, a child, because of the decisions that parents have made. I just don't understand how anyone in the education realm, be it WVSSAC, be it the public schools, be an athletic director, I don't understand how someone can 
desire to punish the student because the parents have made a decision about the child's education that they feel is better for that child. And so to me, this is just a question of, I, I, this word has uh, political connotations, but it's about equality and equity. Mm -hmm. It's about just making certain that the, every student has that opportunity to get the best out of their school years. And for some, go, being able to particip participate in the extracurricular activities, and it's not just sports. It is band. It is debate club. It is those type of things. It is literally what makes school fun and worthwhile for that student. Mm -hmm. Matt Miller, I know you did homeschooling, so I'd like to hear your opinion on this change in the law. Uh, I'm, I'm appreciative of it. Um, our daughter is uh, 17, a junior this year, and um, had talked about maybe doing track. Um, some other things have come up, and, and that's not been an option that, that she has jumped on. She is now going to be, I think, an, an actress. Uh, she has gotten into the Apollo Civic Theater and really has enjoyed that and uh, now working as well. But, uh, yeah, I, I love the idea. And we actually looked into what would she have to do to be able to participate on the track team. My question would be uh, how does that work as far as districts like what where where our family lives we are right on the border where you would go to Martinsburg one way or Musselman the next way so as a homeschool family when it came time to hey she does want to run track her senior year do I have to go one direction or another or is that part of that transfer rule that school choice kind of idea so that's an excellent question so for any student be at home school or private school student um, they would have to participate in their local district school so okay. whatever school they the district has determined they belong to and the parents would be responsible for transportation mm -hmm. just like it is currently and if they do apply for a transfer from out of their district school it would have to be under the same rules for all transfers meaning that the school that you want to transfer to has to have the availability and has to say yes we, we can accommodate you. Um, so again, following all the same rules that regular public school students would have to follow. But again, as a homeschool student, there wouldn't necessarily be classroom space needed, right? So that would kind of wipe that out as long as the coaching staff then would be like, yep, we have room on the team. We would love to have you participate. We might be able to make that transfer, so to speak, since we might live in a different district. That is possible. And that would be locally controlled with the local district. Does that go through? through the athletic directors then at the various schools? Does that have to go through the school board office? How, how does that work? So if you want to participate in the extracurricular activity, mm -hmm. you are going to have to go to the local county school district to be able to fill out the paperwork, tell them mm -hmm. what your intention is to participate. And then from that point on, it's whatever the policies they have set up in place. So they would tell you, this is the policies, this is the who you need to contact. And I would assume that the athletic director would be someone mm -hmm. within that. But, I mean, it's right. up to the local district. And I notice, I want to make sure I'm understanding what you mentioned earlier, not only homeschool, but you mentioned private school. So let's say uh, an area private school like I, I have Faith Christian Academy. I don't believe they have a baseball program. So while they do have some other sports that are available, if some student there said, man, I, I baseball is my favorite sport I'd really love to play this new bill gives them an opportunity to perhaps play on a baseball team of a public school that again would be within their district exactly okay. if they're not offering that sport at the public school at the private, private school, school. sorry right. <laughs> exactly okay Johnny thank you for getting this put through I, I think it's great I mean I'm a big sports fan and as we all know I mean kids are moving around like crazy the rules are basically just skirted Oh, he's living with his cousin or, uh, you know, we had to kick him out. Now he's with grandmother in the school district he wants to play sports in. I, I mean, it happens. The parents who, who homeschool their kids, the parents who send their kids to public school, to private school, it's not like they get a break on their taxes because their kids aren't in school. I mean, they're still paying to fund the schools. I mean, it's just, I mean, not even just for the kids. I mean, just in f overall fairness, they're paying for the schools. Their kids should be able to play sports or do band or do debate club. I, so I, I think it's great. How many years, you said you've been in seven years, 
I want to say this was probably even worked on before that. Yes, it was. I know for a fact there were legislators that wanted to get this done before I came. And I have to give a shout out to Senator uh, Charles Trump. He was the lead sponsor of this legislation in the Senate for many years. I think he, he finally kind of gave up, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave him kudos when we finally got it through. Yeah, my kids had some friends they played youth football with who ended up being home, who were homeschooled then and ended up being homeschooled forever. And, I mean, these were good football players. Um, and they never got a chance to play high school football because the uh, the rules. I mean, they, they chose, their parents chose for them to be homeschooled and – Therefore, they had to, to give up something they really they really loved. I think that's wrong. A lot of people call this the Tebow bill or mm -hmm. Tebow legislation because Tim Tebow was one of those who was homeschooled. But fortunately, in his state, he was allowed to participate in the uh, high school. Well, it's not. I mean, I don't know what percentage of kids are homeschooled. I think it's more now than it was. But I don't think there are enough homeschooled kids where it'll really – you know, shift the, the competitive balance of any high school's programs, you know? The vast majority of homeschool students are not going to be interested in participating. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. just, they're just not. But to me, the point is, why would we deny them? Why would we deny them the ability to try out? And I to point out, I specifically say to try out. They don't have a guaranteed spot on any team or mm -hmm. on any group. It's just an opportunity to try out. And I will tell you that for most um, schools, they're happy to have additional kids interested in the sport and participate mm -hmm. in the sport and fundraising for the sport and you know all of those things that go with part of it it's just having more community involvement is only going to help our guest is senator patricia rucker out of the 16th she uh, formerly education chair now school choice chair and as a result she's uh, had an opportunity to be involved in a lot of meetings that involve public education and of course charter school and alternative education uh, opportunities in the state, which uh, are fairly new uh, by the way, over the just the last couple of years. So let me know, uh, are there any new charter schools coming online in the next year or two in the Eastern Panhandle, Senator Rucker? And exactly how many do we have up and running today that are brick and mortar? So brick and mortar charter schools today, two. Uh, there's a third one that was approved but never found a location. So they're still technically out there and when they find a location may open. And then there's two new applicants um, that I think... Oh boy, now now you caught me. I think one is set to open next year and one to open two years from now. Mm -hmm. I actually need to contact them. The one that is planning to open two years from now in Berkeley County is a business theme charter school. And the focus of this charter school is essentially going to be making certain that the kids have all the tools that they need to start their own business, to run a business, to manage a business. And these are... Um, innovative uh, applicants that actually have had success doing this in Maryland and now want to bring it here to the Berkeley County area and we're very excited about it. There are two brothers who are still in high school who opened up an ice cream shop in downtown Frederick in the winter by the way I might add. Uh, it, on my Where I park on my walk to church I pass it every day. They do great business. They're still in high school. That's awesome. I nice. love to hear that. That's that's tremendous. Do these um, that particular school? Do they have a location yet? Or are they still in early early throws? They're in the early early throws, and um, this is one of the things that's exciting. They clearly know what they're doing because they know exactly how much time it's going to take them to get this going. I have to admit that some of the charter schools that began mm -hmm. were super enthusiastic, mm -hmm. and because of starting maybe a little too soon, they've had a lot of bumps in the road. And uh, but these these folks know what they're doing. I'm, I'm I got to I got to call them. I told them I would call them after the session and then I haven't done so yet. But um well of course uh, any way that I can support and help them. Do you know how many students roughly in West Virginia are enrolled in charter schools this year? <sighs> so no, not exactly. I should pay better attention to those numbers, but um, Ballpark? It's in the thousands. It's in the thousands and uh very excited. I will tell you that the um virtual schools I believe mm -hmm. have um bigger enrollments than the brick and mortar, which makes sense. Brick and mortar are kind of limited in size. Um, having said that, I think all of the charter schools that are currently open to virtual and to brick and mortar are doing very well. I think the 
they've they've smoothed things out. They're now up and going. And um, I don't know if you know that my own daughter decided to attend the charter school, the Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy, and she's been there this year and been um, very happy there. That's in Jefferson County, right? That's in Jefferson Mm -hmm. County. How many many charter schools are there, brick-and-mortar ones in the state, just roughly? Just two. Two brick and mortar charter schools, one in Morgantown, one in Jefferson County. The third one that got approved but hasn't found a location uh, was supposed to be in Nitro, West Virginia, which is kind of in close to the capital. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have the two virtual charter schools, and they're statewide. The one in Jefferson County, that is where uh, Morgan Academy was? No, um, the old Jefferson County Day School mm-hmm. off of Route 51. Okay. So it's kind of, it's actually a great location for them because it's well, close to mm-hmm. Berkeley County and they have Berkeley and Jefferson County students so attending. So that's what, it was Country Day School at one point. Country okay. Day School. Okay, I know exactly. It's a beautiful campus. It what a is great a beautiful place. campus, yes. Yeah, the Morgan Academy, wasn't that where the big arm used to be? Travis Spagent's uh, father's arm wrestling place? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making that up. I thought well, that's what Travis told Morgan me. Morgan Academy is still here in Shepherdstown mm-hmm. nearby, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they're at their location. Uh, Senator Patricia Rucker is our guest here on the program. Matt, how have things gone as far as those those mm-hmm. charter schools? As as you've gotten reports and and you know keeping an eye on their test scores and all of those other elements, are are we seeing the success that we were hoping to see with those? So it's the first year, mm-hmm. and it was rough. You know, in the right. beginning, like I kind of alluded to, it mm-hmm. was a little bit of uh, bumps in the road, um, getting everything, you know, set in place. That was the reason for why we passed a charter school cleanup bill this session that um, made cer- certain things clearer to who would communicate with whom, how the money goes from a public school to a public charter school, if it was a public school student that transferred, or how to handle things like brand new homeschoolers like my daughter who chose to go to public school for the first time. There were things that just weren't totally clear and that caused confusion and that caused some delays. All of that hopefully will get better now, not only because of the experience of these Mm -hmm. four schools, but also because of this legislation we just passed. We also um, made it clear that public charter school students have all the same rights as public school students. So they're gonna, the teachers will be included in professional development that's offered, for example. Uh, The teachers have the right to participate in the retirement plan. All of those type of things, all of that got cleared in this charter school legislation we just passed this session. So all of those things Mm -hmm. should make it easier. We also had a bill that was very important and I'm very grateful got through the legislative process. It's a charter school stimulus fund that will um, let us be able to help brand new charter schools uh, that come into the state because one of the things we didn't take into account when we made charter schools legal in the state, they have no startup funds. So when a public school district wants to open up a new school, they have access to funds and money and support and the school building authority that a charter school does not have. And there are startup costs that you know you have to take into account. Um, some of it administrative costs, some of it logistical costs, like mm-hmm. the building and retrofitting things. So we did get that through the legislative process. So now there will be ability for new charter schools that wanna to come to the state to have access to a startup fund that is kind of like a loan. They would have to pay it back, Mm -hmm. but we can give them some help in the beginning so that hopefully things will be smoother in the future. any of that money available to those two that have already opened brick and mortar that they might be able to make adjustments, changes? Technically, yes, because it's available for their first year of operation, and they are within their first year, but they would have to hurry if they wanted (laughs) to apply for some of that help. Um, I know you're not the education chair any longer, Senator Rucker, but we do know in regards, you mentioned the school building authority, there's a a backlog on requests of schools that want money for uh, new schools, retrofitting schools, uh, what have you. Uh, Was any money increased or included in the SBA budget in addition yes. to what they had previously. Yes, they did get an increase. I don't remember the exact amount, but they did get an increase from the uh, one-time stimulus, uh, not stimulus, one-time funds that we had available this year. Do you have a ballpark as to what it might have gone to? I don't remember. And this is one of the drawbacks since I'm not in the finance committee. Right. I will tell you that 
they review overall the budget with those of us who are not in finance, but I don't get the line item details. Uh, in regards to the school building authority, if charter schools are public schools, why are they not included in the SBA requests? So I actually tried to do that. It didn't get through this session, but part of it is that um, charter schools usually rent or lease buildings and they don't own the buildings. And so that was an issue for school building authority money. Now we did include them in the safe school funding, which is a fund to help keep schools safe. And that's the funds that will help with, you know, those special doors mm -hmm. and all the security measures. We had to put money in there for the charter schools, um, on purpose that said if the if you don't own the building you have to make certain that whatever money is used to make this building safe can be removed from the building so it can't be permanently added to the building if you're leasing it or renting it which makes sense so um so at least they'll have access to the safe school fund you know we made that clear but with the school building authority it's a little bit complicated because of the fact that it won't be owned by the state taxpayers. About a minute left. Anything else legislatively that you want to make sure people know about? Wow. Okay. In one minute. <laughs> you can have more than a minute, but you know, if, if you, you're, well, you're down to if 50 seconds. Stuff. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to point out that um, we made a lot of progress when it came to just education in general. We talked, touched on it briefly last uh, week. You know, my lead bill for this legislative session was actually the dyslexia legislation, which Senator Barrett had been a champion of when he had been in the House. And um, it was really uh, interesting the way we finally got it through, basically thrown into another bill. So of you course. can't tell, but it's uh, it's in there. And, um, and I'm also really grateful we had um, improvements to things that would be taught in our schools, like there was a bill that had to do with making certain genocides are covered um, in history, which I, I think is important. Um, there was, regarding the Safe Schools Fund, we did increase funding for it, which was better. Before we had just given a very base amount, now we gave a more serious amount, and we also uh, passed legislation regarding the ability to use retired uh, military and police to be resource officers in the schools mm. to help provide better security. So there were things that didn't get attention that I think folks should know about that. Um, will hopefully make them feel better about their kids' safety. That's good. Thank you so much for coming in, Senator Patricia Rucker.